Tom Anderson. The great society, or the great step backward, as some of us Americans like to call it, is neither modern nor unique. The great society is socialism. Socialism is a 2,000-year failure. We know what socialism is. We don't have to guess. Unlike the young bride who was complaining to her mother about her husband's drinking, and her mother asked her, well, why in the world did you marry him if you knew he drank so much? She said, well, I didn't know he drank at all till he came home sober one night. Our speaker, Billy James Hargis, has fought the liberal lepers who promote Marxism, Nazism, socialism, immorality for the past 20 years. Reverend Hargis has the dignity and the guts to take an outward open stand for these United States and for Jesus Christ. Billy James Hargis doesn't spend his time opposing other conservatives, as so many conservatives do, reminding me of the two preachers who were earnestly discussing their religious differences, and finally one turned to the other one resignedly and said, after all, we are both trying to do the Lord's work, you in your way and I in his. Billy James Hargis preaches Christ's way, I haven't figured out yet what kind of way it is the hierarchy of the National Council of Churches preaches. But it's not the American way, and from what I know about my Bible, it's not Christ's way. Dr. Billy James Hargis goes to the extreme of buying time on more than 400 radio stations to tell the American people to stick with God instead of with the United Nations. Billy James Hargis preaches Christ and his virgin birth, his divinity, his miracles, his saving power, his resurrection, his promise of eternal life. This is, as Senator Worldbright says of our Constitution, out of date and unsuited for our modern complex life. Billy James Hargis is a dedicated, fundamental, born-again Christian who knows the full story of the insidious, Marxist-oriented, pro-communist organization now going under the name of the National Council of Churches. Dr. Billy James Hargis is about to lay it on the line all about the Judas goats who are leading their flocks to the slaughter. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that the National Council of Churches is an instrument of Satan. I don't think it's any good today, and I don't think it ever will be any good. It's not good for freedom. It's not good for religious orthodoxy. It's not good for spiritual traditions. It's not good for our political or patriotic traditions. The National Council of Churches is an alien group. It is a Marxist group politically. It is an agnostic group theologically. It is out of step with the Bible. It's out of step with church history. The National Council of Churches does not speak for 40 million Protestants in the United States, and they lie when they say that they do. <laughs> Many people don't know that the man who first introduced communism to the United States founded what is today called the National Council of Churches. One culprit in this nation who brought the whole communist conspiracy or communist cancer to this nation from England and Russia was a Methodist preacher by the name of Dr. Harry F. Ward. Now, Dr. Ward pastored a Methodist church in the Stockyards area of Chicago, and while there, he started an outfit called the Methodist Federation for Social Service. He started with just a handful of disciples. He had a marvelous personality. He was a brainy man. He, was a, he, was, he understood the whole Marxist concept and was a tremendous teacher of Marxism. He got a little handful of Methodist preachers. He started what became the first communist front ever set up in the United States. The Attorney General of the United States has identified in, in, for years and years and years the Methodist Federation for Social Service, organized in 1907, still in existence, as a communist front. In fact, on page 2084 of the Congressional Document Investigation of Communist Activities in the New York City area, dated July 7, 1953, we read, the Methodist Federation for Social Service 
was organized by a group of socialist Marxist clergymen of the Methodist Church, headed by Dr. Harry F. Ward, 12 years before the organization of the Communist Party in the United States in 1919. So Dr. Ward brought communism to this country. He first brought it to the church. Now, you would think, considering the godless aspect of communism, that no minister could find anything compatible with communism. But communism first planted its seeds among Protestant clergymen, liberal theological clergymen, at the turn of the century through the activities of one Dr. Harry F. Ward. Now, one year after the Methodist Federation for Social Service was set up to preach Marxism in the name of religion, socialistic revolution in the name of Christianity, Dr. Ward and another clergyman by the name of Walter Rauschenbusch, who was a Baptist and who taught at Colgate Theological Seminary in Rochester, these two men formed a partnership and started what is now known as the National Council of Churches. First came the Methodist Federation for Social Service, then came the Federal Council of Churches one year later, and in 1950, in Cleveland, Ohio, the Federal Council changed its name, as you know, to the National Council of the Churches of Christ in the USA. So Dr. Harry F. Ward, a communist clergyman, Methodist, Dr. Walter Rauschenbusch, a socialist, he never admitted to being a communist, but he admitted he was a socialist, and he believed in overthrowing our system by peaceful revolution. Walter Rauschenbusch, a socialist and a Baptist, set up the Federal Council of Churches, which is today called the National Council of the Churches of Christ. Now, this is the background. I should remind you, while we're considering Harry F. Ward, that this is not the only group that he's the daddy of. He also founded an outfit which is called the American Civil Liberties Union. The founder of the ACLU was the same communist Methodist clergyman, Dr. Harry F. Ward. It was started one year after the formation of the Communist Party, around 1920. Dr. Ward not only started the American Civil Liberties Union, he not only started the National Council of Churches, but he started a third group. He started a group called American League Against War and Fascism. And out of the American League Against War and Fascism came a young named Earl Browder. Earl Browder was a disciple of the Methodist preacher, Harry F. Ward. Earl Browder became the head of the Communist Party in the United States because out of the American League Against War and Fascism came the Communist Party itself. Now, this is your background. Dr. Ward, as you know, is still alive, and he's still being feted. In fact, my beloved friends, in 1963, in the month of October, this is less than two years ago, right? They had a uh, birthday dinner to honor Dr. Harry F. Ward in New York City. Now, the committee to celebrate the 90th birthday anniversary of Dr. Harry F. Ward was sponsored by 72 leaders of the National Council of Churches. I might say that all 72 of these clergymen are interested in the National Council, but 22 of them actually hold positions, either paid jobs or elected jobs or appointed jobs in the National Council of Churches hierarchy. Now, here are some of the people that honored Dr. Harry F. Ward, the communist clergyman who's responsible for this whole sellout. You've got to hand it to this old boy. He did a marvelous job for what he believed. And here are the preachers that uh, comprised or composed the committee to celebrate his 90th birthday. Bishop James C. Baker, Dr. John C. Bennett. By the way, John C. Bennett today is the president of the largest theological seminary in the United States, Union Theological Seminary in New York City. That's why your young preachers are Marxist bent. The largest seminary in America is headed by a man who admits he despises the free enterprise system. In a debate with Tom Anderson in New York City, which was televised, a very famous debate, he admitted that he was a socialist and is working peacefully to overthrow the American system of free enterprise. Dr. John C. Bennett, Dr. Harold A. Bosley, Professor W. Russell Bowie, who, by the way, was one of the translators of the Revised Standard Version, the Bible copyrighted by the National Council of Churches, Bishop Matthew Clare, Jr., Bishop Fred Pierce Corson, Bishop A. Raymond Grant, 
uh, Professor uh, Frederick C. Grant, Professor Paul T. Lehman, Bishop John Wesley Lord, Dr. John A. Mackay. This is the former stated clerk of the Presbyterian denomination who was the first voice in America who urged that we sell Chiang Kai-shek out and turn the Chinese mainland over to Mao Zedong and Zhou Enlai. And until today, he leads the Committee for the Recognition of Red China in the United States. Dr. Benjamin E. Mays, Dr. Walter G. Mulder, Bishop Marshall R. Reed, Dr. William Scarlett, Dr. Ralph W. Sockman, you remember the celebrated pastor of Christ Church in New York City, Reverend Alfred W. Swan, Dr. Henry P. Van Dusen, Bishop William J. Walls, Professor Leroy Waterman, and Bishop Lloyd C. Wick. Now, the communist worker cooperated with these preachers in honoring Dr. Harry F. Ward. In the October 15, 1963 issue of The Communist Worker, I quote, and I'm quoting from the communist publication, Dr. Ward is a link between us and the Christian socialist preachers. You see, in his old age, he has dropped his aura of mystery concerning this connection. He is a link between us and the Christian socialist preachers who sought to end the church's neutrality in the class struggle. He helped set up the American Civil Liberties Union in 1920. He became a firm advocate of friendship with the Soviet Union. We're going to be at Carnegie Hall this Tuesday evening, October 15th, to wish this grand man many more birthdays. We, the communists of America, are sure we will see you there. End of quote. Now, this is the daddy of the National Council of Churches. Is it any wonder, then, that in February of 1960, the House Committee on Un-American Activities held a one-day hearing, February 26, to be exact, into the National Council of Churches and its leadership and their affiliations with communist causes. Let me quote from a government report issued by the Committee of Congress whose job is to protect the internal security of the United States, and this has to do with the National Council of Churches. Quote, We have been careful of the leadership of the National Council of Churches of Christ in America. This committee has found 100 clergymen in leadership capacity with either communist front records or records of service to communist causes. The aggregate affiliations of these 100 leaders is, according to our latest count, into the thousands. 100 leaders of the NCC had thousands of affiliations with Communist Front activities in the United States, according to the House Committee on Un-American Activities and this official government report. On the basis of authoritative sources, this committee the statement that there is infiltration of fellow travelers in churches and schools is a complete understatement. It's not an exaggeration or an overstatement. It is an understatement. Now, because some of these preachers, who are not quite dry behind the ears, are so ignorant, try to defend the National Council of Churches by saying that the FBI has cleared them I want to tell you, my friends, this is just another lie that is being told by the National Council of Churches. They have never been cleared by the FBI, and when a preacher says they have been, you can tell him to his face he's either dumb or he's a fool, and in either case, he shouldn't be a preacher. Now, here is the facts. So that we could get Mr. Hoover on record on July the 10th, 1961, of friend of ours, Mrs. Margaret West of Tulsa, Oklahoma, wrote a letter to J. Edgar Hoover because a Christian church preacher, disciples preacher, not independent preacher, but a disciples preacher in Tulsa by the name of Reverend David O. Reese had stated on Tulsa television that the FBI had cleared the National Council of Churches. The letter was written to Mr. Hoover, and here's his answer of July 18, 1961, colon, quote, I would like to point out that the FBI does not issue clearances of any kind. There was no specific investigation made in connection with the subject of your inquiry. 
So the next time they come out and tell you they have been cleared by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, they are telling a lie. And that's the only thing that you can call it. Now, we've given you something of its history. What about its role today? Every problem in the United States today, race agitation, immorality, and even a socialistic political revolution is due directly to both active leadership of the National Council of Churches or its failure to declare itself in defense of Christian traditions. I contend that every problem that confronts us internally today is the making of the National Council of Churches, perhaps more than any other organization in this country. Now, first of all, race agitation. I said that they were responsible for race agitation, and that they are. The National Council of Churches, as I said, changed its name from Federal Council to that in 1950. They have long been agitating minority races in the United States for what I believe to be not spiritual reasons, but political reasons. The National Council of Churches published this book, which is called The Negro American, A Reading List. And if you haven't seen this book, which proves that they are race agitators, as I said, and the role that they play in racial agitation, I ask you to write to me, our Christian crusade, Tulsa to Oklahoma, enclose one dollar and we'll send you four copies of it, one to keep and three to distribute. We have reproduced the National Council of Churches reading list. This book put out by the National Council of Churches indicts themselves. Now listen to what they say in the introduction. They are telling preachers that they are to stock these books that they recommend. They are to stock them in their church libraries and not to be, not to be satisfied there. They are to get these books in the school library so that young people of America will understand the, quote, Negro American, end of quote. Now they say, one, these books are safe to recommend to children, especially in junior high school and elementary grades. They're going after the kids young, which, of course, is the old philosophy of Lenin. Lenin said, give me a boy or a girl until he is seven and he will be a Marxist forever. I used to think that was an absurd statement, but I'm not so sure anymore. Now, in this book, the National Council of Churches recommends first by subject, then by names of the books, and then by authors, a group of books that you are to put in your church library and school library so that our youth, especially the younger ones, will understand. Now, who are the authors that they recommend? Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's just take a few. First of all, they recommend Herbert Apfecker. Herbert Apfecker, as you know, is the editor of the Communist Monthly Magazine in the United States. His daughter is the girlfriend of Mario Savio, who created the disturbance at Berkeley, California, if you want to know some little intimate facts. Apfecker's daughter has been chasing around the country with Savio, appearing on these college campuses since his successful revolution at Berkeley. Her dad, Herbert Apfecker, as I said, is a communist author. He's also, for many years, the editor of the Communist Monthly Theoretical Journal. The National Council of Churches recommends his books for church libraries. Let's go to the second author. The second author that the National Council of Churches recommends is W.E.B. Du Bois. Who is Du Bois? Well, ladies and gentlemen, the NAACP, and, and I know a lot of fine white people, a lot of fine Negro people that have been completely misled by the NAACP. I have tried to tell my Negro friends that the NAACP is not your friend. The NAACP is trying to use the American Negro to advance some liberal white men's political biasness, and that's all it is. For instance, you can't ignore the fact there were seven founders, NAACP, only one of them was a Negro. 
The only one that was a Negro was W.E.B. Du Bois, who was a communist. He admitted he was a communist. He said he was a member of the Communist Party. Can you believe a man when he says he's a communist? I think so. W.E.B. Du Bois, a member of the Communist Party, was one of the seven founders of NAACP. The NAACP will not allow a Negro president. They've never had a Negro president. Their present president is a white man, an extreme socialist liberal by the name of Spengarn. It is a family affair. Spengarn has been president for a decade. He will be president until he dies. His father was president before him. It's a one-family, white, socialistic, political action program that has fooled a lot of good Negroes and white people alike. Now, ladies and gentlemen, W.E.B. Du Bois was a red. He married a woman by the name of Shirley Graham, who's still alive. The boy died, thank God, two years ago, but Shirley Graham's still alive. I mean that. His wife still works for the communist worker. Now, W.B. Du Bois is one of the authors recommended by the National Council. Now, referring to Shirley Graham, let's go to the next page. The National Council of Churches wants you to put in your church library the following books by Shirley Graham. One, two, three, four, five, six books written by the widow of W.E.B. Du Bois, a member of the editorial staff of the Communist Worker, and they want you to stock your church library with six of her books so that your youth will understand the Negro American. Let's go to the next name. The next name is Langston Hughes. Langston Hughes is the favorite author on this subject of the National Council because they recommend one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine of his books. They want you to put nine books by Langston Hughes in your church library. By the way, Langston Hughes, who, as you know, has been under fire for years because of his pro-communism, has now gone back to work for the NAACP. You see, it's no longer unpopular for a communist to work for a liberal group. Your Hollywood 10, your producers and writers that were outlawed because of communism. One of the most celebrated members of that motley crew was Dalton Trombo, who's now gone back to work for the industry. And I understand that he has been asked to write the screenplay for the film that's now being filmed on the Bible. So Langston Hughes can now come out of the woodworks and go back to work the NAACP. Dalton Trumbo can come back out of the woodworks, and by the way, he was pulled out of the woodworks by Kirk Douglas. Kirk Douglas was the one who, who first shattered the Hollywood ban and brought Dalton Trumbo back into the field. Now these former Reds, and who were known for their Red activities, are back in the news again. Look at who's in Los Angeles today, Paul Robeson. One of, the, one of the pioneer Negro communists in the United States is the guest today of the First Unitarian Church in Los Angeles, where Reverend Stephen Fritzman is pastor. Reverend Fritzman is well known as one of the national officers for the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, of which Lee Harvey Oswald was a local chapter leader. Now, the Los Angeles Times, you read the front section the front page of the second section of the Sunday Los Angeles Times, and see the beautiful, beautiful, glowing article they have on Paul Robeson. It's marvelous. They even hesitate to suggest that Paul might be a communist. And after all, he's in good company these days. He's visiting the First Unitarian Church in Los Angeles, so there must not be anything wrong with him. This is the feeling or the innuendo of the article. This Langston Hughes that we're talking about is best known for a blasphemous poem called Goodbye Christ. And this is typical of some of his writing. I won't read it all because I despise the thing. But I'll read a portion of it so that you can see the author that the National Council of Churches so enthusiastically recommends as safe for children. Quote, Listen, Christ, you did all right in your day, I reckon, but that day's gone now. They ghosted you up a swell story, too, called it the Bible, but it's dead now. The popes and the preachers have made too much money from it. They've sold you to too many kings, generals, robbers, and killers, even the Tsar and the Cossacks, even Rockefeller's church, even the Saturday Evening Post. You ain't no good no more. 
They've pawned you till you're done wore out. Goodbye, Christ Jesus, Lord God Jehovah. Beat it all away from here now. Make way for a new guy with no religion at all, a real guy named Marx, communist, Lenin, peasant, Stalin, worker, me. I said me. Go ahead on now. You're getting in the way of things, Lord. Step on the gas, Christ. Move. Don't be so slow about moving. The world's mine from now on. Nobody's going to sell me to a king or a general or a millionaire. Goodbye, Christ. Good morning, revolution. This is the author most recommended in the Negro American by the National Council of Churches. It would not be a difficult thing for me to stand up here and show you how the National Council of Churches was involved in the St. Augustine riots. How that attorneys that are on the paid staff of the National Council of Churches appeared in St. Augustine even before the revolution broke out. And as soon as the so-called civil rioters were arrested, they were bailed out and defended by the National Council of Churches. I could show you, for instance, how the National Council of Churches put up the $250,000 of the money to send the students into Mississippi last summer. And you recall, unfortunately, three of those young men were killed. The National Council of Churches put up the money for the Mississippi invasion. They put up the money for the defense of the radicals in St. Augustine, and now the National Council of Churches, through your missionary contributions, you understand, if you're in a church filled with the National Council of Churches, you're helping on this. If you're in a church, it's in the National Council of Churches, you may not like it, and you may not like me for saying it, but you just well to know it, you're helping with this. The National Council of Churches is now putting up the money to build an FM radio station in Mississippi to agitate the minority races down there, and it will be nothing in the world but a center of agitation and violence. This, again, is the role of the National Council of Churches in the racial agitation field. But let's go to the second point. I said they were also responsible for this current wave of immorality. But let me review just a little, and this is all things that just happened. Here's the New York Times for Sunday, January 17th this year. The headline says, Minister defines true obscenity. Now, the minister's name is Reverend Howard Moody. He's pastor of a Protestant church affiliated with the NCC. He's often quoted in NCC circles. He's very popular as a lecturer. Pastor of the Judson Memorial Church, 55 Washington Square, South in New York City. Let me quote from the New York Times. Vulgar speech. And off-spoken but seldom printed four-letter words are not immoral or blasphemous. According to the New York Baptist minister, the Reverend Howard Moody. Reverend Moody maintained today that vulgar and body language may well be objected to on the basis of social manners, but it is not a moral case. It is hardly justifiable to make a moral or theological case against raw language as the church has tended to do. He goes on to say that his position, his crusade against uh, uh, forbidding vulgar speech and, and off-spoken four-letter words in public circles and in church circles, his crusade to against any such prohibition has the support of, quote, well-known theologians Reinhold Niebuhr and John C. Bennett. Now, this is one article. Now we go on to March the 26th, the same paper, the same preacher. Back in January the 17th, he's saying four-letter words, and you know what he's talking about, that these are not vulgar or obscene, and nobody should... Nobody should try to prohibit them. They may not be socially acceptable, but there's nothing wrong with them. Now, on March the 26th, we read another headline from the New York Times about the same church, same preacher. Headline, dance program offers two nudes. Waterman switch given at the Judson Church. Let me quote the article. You won't believe this, my friends, but it's here. Nudity may be banned from the Broadway stage, but it found sanctuary last night in the pulpit of the Judson Memorial Church in New York City. With nothing on but a tape recorder playing Iris from Verdi, two dancers clasped 
in a face-to-face -face embrace, move discreetly across the stage of the church in a short selection called Waterman Switch. Now, this is a little hard to believe, but it's happening. The Judson Memorial Church, a Baptist church affiliated with the American Baptist Convention, in turn affiliated with the National Council of Churches, in New York City, had as a part of its church program on a recent Sunday a dance with two nudes adorned with nothing. They had absolutely nothing on. Less than a burlesque dancer, nothing. The article goes on to say that the dancers Robert Morris and Yvonne Rainier seemed almost intent on showing that nudity on stage can be nearly as prim and proper as a church social. Well, it says, for their curtain calls after the service, <laughs> the performers in Waterman Switch came out in bathrobes. That was nice of them. Now, this is the preacher, pastor of the American Baptist pulpit in New York City, Judson Memorial Church, who first of all says that four-letter words or curse words are not vulgar and there should be no effort taken against the use of this language by the church. And now he includes in his church program a dance by two nudes. This, my friends, is the perversion not only of religion, but the perversion of morals and integrity that unfortunately is not only being permitted by religious leaders, but in some instances is actually being encouraged. Now let me give you an example of that. This just happened, by the way. In fact, it happened uh, the, uh, just a few months back, December 21st to be exact, just prior to Christmas last year. For the Christmas sermon on the campus of Baltimore's Goucher College. Now, this is a girls' school. This is a school for girls, and they hire a chaplain. And, of course, these chaplains always have to be in agreement with the National Council of Churches because the National Council and their associates control these sensitive positions as chaplains of these universities. The chaplain of Baltimore's Goucher College is the Reverend Dr. Frederick C. Wood, Jr. for his Christmas sermon before an audience filled with girl students at this select school, he decided to preach on premarital sexual relations. I have, a, I actually have a script of his message, and I'll read you a portion of it. Sex is good, sex is fun, it's also funny. Premarital intercourse is not bad or dirty, indeed it can be very beautiful. Sex is natural, we ought not take sex so seriously. We all ought to relax and stop feeling guilty about our sexual activities, thoughts, and desires. Sex is interpersonal, it involves two people. Free love is not detrimental. And on and on and on and on. Now this was the chaplain, the Protestant chaplain of the Goucher's Girl College at Baltimore, Maryland in his pre-Christmas message, telling these young ladies that they need not feel a sin guilt or a guilt complex about premarital sex relations. And you ask me why the United States is going nuts. Now, one of the churches associated with the big sister group of the National Council of Churches, the World Council of Churches, is the Protestant Church or the Lutheran Church of Sweden. I do not know if you're familiar with this, but just two months ago, according again to the New York Times, the official Church of Sweden came out and officially stated in the official church weekly, Our Church, that premarital sex relations between unmarried youth can no longer be considered as sin by the church. So the Church of Sweden has now declared openly that premarital sexual relations is not sin. As I said, the Church of Sweden is an affiliate with the World Council of Churches, and this, of course, is the same thing that you found at Goucher College, and the same thing you're finding in New York, and the same thing you're finding everywhere else. Now let's add to that something that happened right here in your own territory. I'm holding now a photostat copy of the San Francisco Chronicle for January 18th, for January 3rd, and for December the 7th. This has to do with these Methodist and Episcopal clergymen in San Francisco who are preaching homosexual practices as legitimate 
and not a sin among the youth of the San Francisco Bay Area. First of all, let me quote from the January 18th Chronicle. A prominent Methodist pastor, the Reverend John V. Moore, made an appeal to the members of his congregation yesterday to devote some of their time to a dialogue between overt homosexuals and lesbians. This appeal was made during a spirited seminar in the Glide Memorial Methodist Church. Following a sermon of Reverend Mr. Moore on the needs to integrate homosexuals into the churches in the Bay Area. Nearly 150 men and women remained after the service and spent an hour wrestling with such questions as one, what is normal in bed? And second, what is a seduction? When is a seduction antisocial? Moore was helped in this speech, welcoming homosexuals into this Methodist church by an attorney in the congregation by the name of Evander Smith. And Evander Smith added some things to the sermon of the Reverend Mr. Moore. He said that queers or homosexuals were particularly averse to molesting little children. Well, I'm sure that this is not in keeping with the police records of Los Angeles County. For years and years and years, the FBI and Hoover and the police authorities have told us that a homosexual is the most likely breed of, of, of people to molest children. But according to the Methodist preacher in San Francisco, all of this information put out by crime enforcement officials is wrong. And one of the best ways that you can prevent child molesting, I suppose, by his reasoning, is everybody be a homosexual. Now, in the January 3rd San Francisco Chronicle, the January 3rd San Francisco Chronicle, they talk about a homosexual dance that the church put on. Four ministers, here's their pictures, the Reverend Louis Dirkman, Reverend Cecil Williams, Canon Robert Cromie of the Episcopal Church, Reverend Fred Bird, Reverend Charles Lewis, Reverend Clarence Colwell, and Reverend Ted McElvina. Now, there were four actual pastors. The rest of these men were assistants. They put on a dance for homosexuals. Some of the men came dressed as women. The article is quite descriptive, and it's quite, uh, I wouldn't even read it all. I won't put this kind of junk in my mind, and the only reason I'm reading any of it is to show you how the preachers, the liberal preachers of the National Council of Churches are contributing to the delinquency of this nation. And I want to say this to you, my friends. Don't you ever start dealing, even though you're doing it for research reasons, don't you ever start dealing in this kind of junk because it's like a cancer. If it gets in your mind, it'll start eating away, and Christian people should, should stay as far away from this type of pornography and this type of filth as possible. And I say that to you with all frankness. I will not read it. I will not read it. Ministers of four Protestant denominations. Now, these are four preachers. Instead of, uh, instead of opposing the, the homosexuals of San Francisco, they're opposing the police authorities for arresting them. Ministers of four Protestant denominations accuse the police department of intimidation, broken promises, and obvious hostility in breaking up a dance for homosexuals at California Hall Friday night. The ministers sponsored the event. They charged they too had been harassed by police officials. They shouldn't have been harassed. They ought to have been hanged. I say that facetiously, but that's true. Now, don't go out and say that I advocated hanging four preachers. I said that facetiously. They should have been fired from their churches, to say the least, and driven out of the ministry, and their ordination paper should have been taken away from them. They should have been defrocked for very good reasons. They charged, too, that they had been harassed by policemen, questioned at length about their theological concepts. The ball was attended by 600 homosexuals and their friends, and a dozen ministers to raise funds to integrate the churches with homosexuals. Police saturated the hall with from 20 to 40 police officers arresting six persons, terrified the guests, and so forth and so on. The December 7th issue of the San Francisco Chronicle is the activity of the vicar of the St. Aidan's Episcopal Church in San Francisco. He says that the church has ignored the homosexuals, and he has formed a fraternity of 30 homosexuals called the Council on Religion and Homosexuals. And, uh, oh, this is quite a thing. You should read it all. He says there are 80,000 homosexuals in San Francisco, and that's a 
and he uses the word, it's, quote, H-E-L-L of a lot of people. This is the pastor of the Episcopal Church, you remember. He says, we can't say to them we don't want to talk to them. It's like telling an alcoholic he's bad, so we're going to bring them into the church. We're going to integrate them into the church, and we're going to change the Christian viewpoint concerning homosexuality. So there you have it, my friends. I believe that the church of Jesus Christ ought to set an example in righteousness and virtuous living, and when a minister... When a minister participates in filth like this, this man is not fit to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I would point out to you that none of these preachers urging the integration of the church with homosexuals or urging the church to change its mind concerning sodomy, none of these ministers voted for Goldwater. They're all in acceptable churches, the liberal variety associated with the National Council of Churches, without exception. The National Council of Churches is back of the socialistic political revolution. We'll get into South Vietnam now, and you must hear this. I don't know if you read it or not. Seventy-five officers of the National Council of Churches called on Secretary of Defense McNamara and demanded that we get out of South Vietnam. They claim they spoke for 40 million Protestants, which, of course, is a lie. Now, the spokesman for the group was Dr. Edwin Theodore Dahlberg, who's the pastor of the Baptist Church in St. Louis, Missouri. It's a bi-affiliated uh, uh, church. It's affiliated with both the Southern Baptist and the American Baptist Convention. Dr. Dahlberg was former president of the National Council of Churches. He was the spokesman for the group calling on McNamara demanding that we get out of South Vietnam and turn that area over to the communists. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the National Council of Churches is not supposed to lobby, but they do. If I were to send a lobbyist, I have tax exempt status for Christian Crusades so that your gifts are deductible from your taxable income. But if I sent a lobbyist to Washington, D.C., they would have legal grounds to take away the tax exempt status of Christian Crusade in 24 hours. The National Council of Churches sent 75 lobbyists to Washington this week to call on the Secretary of Defense, to call on senators and congressmen demanding that we get out of South Vietnam and turn it over to the Reds. But nobody questions their tax exempt status. Two years ago, they had 100 lobbyists in Washington to abolish the House Committee on American Activities. And if failing to get sufficient support among congressmen to do that, to cut off the financial appropriations to this congressional committee whose job is to protect our internal security. Last year, they had 300 lobbyists in Washington to pass the Civil Rights Bill. All of this violates Internal Revenue Codes. All of this is against the law. But ladies and gentlemen, these liberals are a law unto themselves. They're not a people of law. They are a people of lawlessness. They take the law into their own hand. They interpret the law at will in keeping with their emotional biasness. Now, the National Council of Churches has just put out a pronouncement on South Vietnam. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I didn't support Johnson. But I want you to know whether the president is Democrat or Republican. When he's right, I'm for him, and when he's wrong, I'm against him. And I want to go on record as saying that I am 100% in accord with our presence in South Vietnam and in the Dominican Republic. We have got to stop communist aggression someplace. Somewhere down the line, we're going to have to say, look, you can't go any further. Johnson is doing exactly what Goldwater would do regarding South Vietnam, were he there. My only concern is this. My only concern is this. If you'll read the front page of the Los Angeles Times today, you'll see that the biggest guns in liberalism are in Washington today. There are 4,000 of them. And they're going to stay there this whole week demanding that Johnson get out of South Vietnam and set up a neutral government. And you know what a neutral government is. 
It is just a fancy word for a government which contains communists, and inevitably the communists will be the government, not the neutrals. In every instance, a neutral government becomes a communist government. It's just the first phase of a government becoming communist, the so-called neutral policies of Averill Harriman. Now, here you have these preachers lobbying. Now, here's the pronouncement of the National Council, and I quote it to you, and it's, I want you to listen. This isn't from the communist worker. This isn't from the W.E.B. Du Bois clubs or from this little brat Mario Savio. This is from the National Council of Churches that claims to speak for 40 million of us. Here's what they say, quote, Americans are currently asking these questions about our nation's participation in the war in South Vietnam. One, why has the president failed to provide us with more complete and up-to-date information? Second, why is our government so concerned to emphasize North Vietnamese aggression, and can we really prove that the communists are the aggressors? Now, this is so asinine and naive, it doesn't even deserve a comment. The National Council of Churches says, we don't believe, Johnson, that the, that the communists are the aggressors. We doubt if the communists are the aggressors in Vietnam. Then they go on to say, this is quite strange. They actually, in parentheses, they have this question. How stupid does our government think Americans are? <laughs> in other words, the innuendo is that the communists are not aggressors in South Vietnam and that we have lied about this to justify intervention in South Vietnam. Then they go on to say, why does our government appear deaf to appeals for neutralization? End of quote. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if the National Council of Churches speaks for you in this statement, then you ought to stay in your church. But if the National Council of Churches does not speak for you in this instance, you ought to keep your money out of that organization and put it in some movement like Christian Crusade that's trying to save this country and carry on an anti-communist cause. And furthermore, I don't hesitate to tell you, for your own sake, you need to find a Bible-believing church in your town where your soul can be fed. God's people need feeding. And it's not right for you to subject your children to liberal brainwashing in church. They get enough of it in school. It's not right that they have to be subjected to it in church. Find a church where the Bible's preached and New Testament Christianity is practiced. And put your emphasis there. But you remember this, my beloved friends. At the same time, you have a national cause like Christian Crusade. And unless you support these national causes, your local causes don't have a Chinaman's chance for survival. Because if they ever wipe us out on the top level, then they get next to you. And how could you survive with just a handful of people and a little town? We are buffet. We're, we are, we're serving as buffers for the whole cause of Christ. They're hitting at us, and I don't mind it if the people will stand with us and enable us to carry on our activities in spite of all the tremendously well-financed opposition. Well, my friends, I want to tell you, before there was a Christian crusade today that has chapters all over America, hundreds of thousands of friends, millions of listeners, before we had this success, there was a Gethsemane. When we suffered and when everyone turned against us, even members of our own family, would have nothing to do with us because they couldn't understand. And I know what these ministers who are, for the first time in their lives, militantly opposing communism, I know what they're going to go through if they're not already going through it. So pray for these young men who for the first time are taking a stand because Satan throws everything he has at these men. Headline, the disciples of Christ voted today 897 to 655 opposing. Send more missionaries into Africa? No. Send more missionaries into the South? No. To admit Red China to the United Nations and have diplomatic exchange with Red China. Here it is. 
The National Council of Churches went on record favoring the admission of Red China. Now the denominations are doing it. So it's being preached through the denominational literature. Is it any wonder that in the book of Revelation, when you read of the coming world government, the Bible points out that that world government will have a world church at its side. The Bible says ultimately every nation will lose its identity and Satan will dwell over the faces of the earth as a world dictator. Satan incarnate in the person of the Antichrist. And at his side will be the world church, world amalgamation of religions, pagan and Christian. My friends, you can go on as you've been going on, put your money in new cars and finer homes, better businesses, nicer fur coats, and you're going to see this country topple around you just like that house built on sand. I tell you, my friends, my biggest discouragement is when I see God's people failing to accept a responsible role in this fight to preserve Christian freedom in the world. It's up to the Church of Jesus Christ. You have forgotten, apparently, so many of us. We have forgotten what Jesus said to us. He says, Occupy till I come. If we haven't been occupying. We're silent. We're a silent church. We don't stand up for what we believe. We don't support what is right. We don't sacrifice for the cause. What are we waiting for? We've got to take a son and throw him in a foxhole or bomb an American city before you put some time and money in this fight to awaken your fellow men and try to save the country. Everything I've said for 20 years on radio was true. I said communism was our enemy. Now the communists are killing your sons in South Vietnam. I said there was communism on college campuses. Now the liberals are admitting that there's communism on college campuses, including Berkeley. Everything we have said was true. They ridiculed us. They held us up in contempt. They questioned our motives. Even the administrations moved against us. And we had to go out with tin cups and beg people to give us a dime or a quarter to save their kids and their kids. And then when I got a few dollars to buy a few minutes of radio time, they questioned my motives and called me a patron for profit. How much can one human being take? I've taken 20 years of ridicule and contempt, but bless God, I'd rather die fighting communism than to ever live under communism.